Uh, so my name is David Kay. I teach law here at UCI, um, and we're we're sort of we're sort of transitioning in a way here on this panel from a conversation or a series of conversations that, like you know, very simplistically, we might think of as uh, empire or empires as national projects, right? And um, and what I think what we're going to try to do on this panel is to conceptualize the sort of an imperial sounding project, which is global governance, right? Global, go global governance as a phrase has, I think, a lot of baggage that we don't often unpack. We're not necessarily going to unpack it, but, but I hope that what we can do is talk a little bit about some of the complexities in global governance, how they reflect back on issues of empire, uh, global uh, solutions, and so forth. Um, and I just want to start by, um, by saying a couple of words about global governance, and in particular, um, to, to kind of situate it as, as a really, it's a strange beast when you think about the United Nations as a kind of dream of idealists uh, at the outset, but, but locking in two different things. On, on the one hand, they built a structure for decolonization in the trusteeship council, in um, provisions of the UN Charter over uh, non-self-governing territories. There was sort of a, a vision of decolonization that I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about on this panel. But at the same time, it locked in essentially the power of you know, five empires, right, in the UN Security Council, some of which were kind of dying, uh, some which might have been not yet at their greatest power yet, but certainly when you think about the permanent members, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, you have a counter to a kind of democratization or an idealism of the UN itself. And so, um, so global governance, at least within the UN context, I think presupposes a kind of control, but it also has within it a, a kind of framework to solve problems of universal concern. Um, and, and, and also, in trying to solve some of those problems of global concern, problems that actually have a disproportionate impact on the formerly colonized, the, the formerly left out of the global system, uh, and so forth. So, so in this panel, I hope that what we can do is talk about how global governance fits into our consideration of empire, and I think that I'm sure that uh, our, our panelists here can really help us um, walk through issues of global governance today. And, and what we'll try to do is really begin with a few short remarks from each of our panelists, really like three minutes or so, to introduce the work that they're doing. Um, but then, given that we, we have reduced, like in the best sense of the word, um, very quickly, I want to open it up to conversation, some of which will be cross-panel, some, some of which will be, for sure, coming from you, and I'm, I'll be moderating that, uh, that discussion. So um, I'm just very briefly going to introduce our panelists, and then, and then I'll turn it over to them uh, to, to say a few remarks to start. So on the far left, um, and, and this is the direction that we'll go eventually. I don't know if this is any signal of politics either, but on the far left <laughs> is, is Anne, Anne Kokas, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. She teaches at the University of Virginia. She works on um, issues of US, China, media and technology, uh, competition and so forth. And in, in 2022, she wrote a book called, published a book called Trafficking Data, How China, is winning the battle for digital sovereignty. So I think part, part of our conversation, obviously, in a modern global governance context has to talk about data, of course. Um, uh, second, moving moving to the right, um, yeah, I got a nod, yeah, yes, to the right, um, is Etel Salingen, who is a distinguished professor of political science um, and peace and conflict studies, if I read it correctly, but I think of political science here at UC Irvine. Um, she uh, won a National Academy of Science Award uh, for really for a life's work on the control of nuclear weapons and her nuclear weapons research. She works quite a bit in the space of um, supply chains uh, today, and I think we'll talk some of, about some of that 
as well in, uh, in her initial comments. Um, then to the right of Etel is Alex Wong. Uh, and, and by the way, there's a common thread of UCLA here on this <laughs> panel. At some level, everybody has a connection to UCLA, but, uh, but Alex is a professor of law at UCLA. He's the co-director of the Emmett Institute on um, uh, Climate Change and the Environment. Uh, he works on the law and politics of China, and in particular, Chinese um, uh, environmental governance. And, and then finally, to at the far right of the panel, <laughs> is, um, is the far right. Yeah, you're the oh, I'm the far right. <laughs> I'm sort of above the other side. Um, on the, uh, is Cal Rostiala. Cal is also a professor at UCLA School of Law and uh, the director of the Berkeley Institute uh, on International Relations at UCLA. Um, and he recently published, just within the last uh, few months, published a book um, called uh, The Absolutely Indispensable Man. Is that right? That's the, um, uh, Ralph Bunch, The United Nations, and The Fight to End Empire. The Fight to End em Empire. Empire. The Fight to End Empire. So empire, he actually got empire into the <laughs> title of his book. So of course, Cal had to be Quite a long ahead. Yeah, he was thinking right, five years ago when he was in the All right, so, um, so please uh, welcome the panel. I'll turn it over to Anne to, to start us off. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, and thank you to our panel organizers and to all of the terrific panelists today. I've learned a huge amount, and um, it's tough, as everyone has mentioned, it's tough going at the end. So I'm going to try to be brief so that we have just lots of, lots of opportunity for dialogue. Um, so when we're thinking about when we're thinking about data and when we're thinking about sovereignty, one of the things that I think is most important to look at is this relationship between national sovereignty and empire. And in the, when particularly looking at the US-China context, we see these emergent visions of what constitutes the relationship between national sovereignty and international power. Within a Chinese context, there's this vision of cyber sovereignty, which is essentially emerged in 2010 as this idea that China has control over all of its digital assets, um, which includes infrastructure, but then has evolved to include everything from um, the path from the data that's gathered by Chinese companies, not just domestically, but also globally, um, Chinese digital infrastructure or the companies that produce Chinese digital infrastructure and the party's ability to influence um, influence those firms through things like um, capital capital export requirements and um, and also the bodily potential bodily harm of CEOs um, who are still located in China. Um, in a U.S. context, we, we see the idea of surveillance capitalism emerging as a sort of model for, for U.S. sovereignty or the U.S. transnational, transnational control of the digital landscape. Um, this idea that was, uh, uh, that was introduced by Shoshana Zuboff, the commodification of the human experience, and one that is mediated and one that is executed by large transnational corporations, most of which are based in the United States. Now, when we see the intersection of China's cyber sovereignty model and the US surveillance capitalism model, we see kind of the worst of all worlds where this surveillance capitalism approach is then leveraged by Chinese firms, which can then gather large amounts of user data um, and then face pressure to report back to the Chinese state. Now, I want to be very clear that most of, that most of these firms are not acting in the service of the Chinese state. They also have contested relationships with, um, with Chinese state power. Um, but for example, com companies like Alibaba or Tencent most recently have had um, the Chinese state take golden shares or government owned shares of those companies, which build on other, other, and in my book, I talk about this in excruciating detail. So I just wanna tell everyone there's a lot more going on here. So if there isn't enough detail, um, I'm also happy to talk about it in Q and A. Um, there's this, there are these large ways in which the Chinese government can, can pressure companies. Now, in the middle, we see companies like we see countries like Japan or um, regions like the European Union, Australia, Korea assert these ideas of digital sovereignty, which um, build on existing, uh, which build on existing colonial power projects that they have, but are also designed to protect themselves against the surveillance capitalism perpetrated by U.S. based firms, as well as the cyber sovereignty practices of the Chinese government. So I'm going to leave it at that, and there's a lot more to unpack, but I look forward to hearing from Etta. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, too, will be brief and uh, just lay out some of the questions that may be of interest 
to the audience and uh, co-panelists. Um, so my marching orders were to address uh, the uh, nuclear issues as they relate to governance or non-governance. And um, it's very hard to uh, find encouragement in what I'm about to say, uh, although I may have a couple of um, pieces at the end um, to pull it together. So the, the world uh, is, according to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, uh, which is a, a, a famous uh, publication, uh, according to that, the world is closer to annihilation uh, than it has ever been since World War II. And uh, they show that by moving the doomsday clock, this very famous um, feature of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, forward from 100 uh, seconds to midnight to 60, um, sorry, 90 seconds to midnight, where midnight is Armageddon. And why is that movement? Uh, well, apart from climate change and uh, new possible pandemics and things of that sort, the thrust of it really has to do with Russia's threats to use nuclear weapons in the Ukraine as a main reason. And it's not just Putin, uh, it's also some other officials uh, that have extended these veiled threats uh, to rely on nuclear weapons uh, to, uh, to take this war to where they want it to be. Now, Russia's uh, national security strategy includes a doctrine uh, that they call escalate to de-escalate that countenances the, the use of, of, of tactic, tactical nuclear weapons in that casual scenario. So, um, uh, and by the way, Russia's arsenal is uh, of, of tactical nuclear weapons includes none uh, other than 1900 tactical nuclear weapons designed uh, for this use in the battlefield or other short range. And by the way, each one of these weapons can be of the size of a Hiroshima and Nagasaki weapon, but they can also be 100 times uh, that, um, that size. So um, I'm going to, from now on, uh, in the two minutes left or so, just tell you what are the issues at hand, in addition to this broad scenario that I just depicted, uh, that might be worth uh, discussing in this context. The first one has to do with Ukraine, because Ukraine is a very special case that connects vertical nuclear proliferation, you know, the sizable arsenals of, of especially the five major nuclear uh, weapon states with horizontal proliferation. And that has goes back to the fact that Ukraine actually had inherited nuclear weapons from the former Soviet Union and gave them up uh, through something called the Budapest Memorandum. And that has implications for everything we see today. Countries out there are saying, well, maybe they shouldn't have, or things of that sort. There's a lot to tackle on that one. So that's issue number one, and I can talk more about how Putin in 2013 already used some of these threats uh, prior to his invasion of the Ukraine in 2014, because we all keep thinking it's 2022. It ain't. The world didn't respond in 2014, uh, unfortunately, as they might have responded. And maybe we would not have seen what, what we see today. Although that's, of course, a counterfactual. We all like, you know, in our respective fields uh, to entertain counters. We should entertain counterfactuals. We've been doing that all day. Now, this is second issue. <laughs> well, yeah, that's all you learn. I mean, there is a very, very positive dimension to studying counterfactuals. Um, now, that's one issue. So what's the value of security assurances and all that? Where do we go from here? What, what happens to horizontal proliferation, meaning the diffusion of nuclear weapons? We haven't actually had a diffusion of nuclear, we nuclear weapon states for decades now, except for North Korea and perhaps Iran. Uh, so what are we, where are we headed in that domain? Another question, of course, is the whole cluster of issues of what is potent thinking? What is animating him? Is it as cognitive, so sociopathic, you know, all of this, where, what is he thinking and how are we gonna respond? How are we responding? 
that's another class solution. The third one is China. And of course, uh, China had a, what in my view was a brilliant nuclear strategy. I mean, the experts on China can prove me wrong, but the brilliancy of it during the charm offensive and prior to that was to keep it small. It was called a minimal deterrent. At least you didn't build up the 10,000, 15,000 nuclear warheads that the US and, uh, and the Soviet Union uh, did. They were keeping it as a minimal deterrent enough, enough to remember, not to defend themselves, but to pre nuclear weapons are supposed to be about preventing use, not about uh, defense, but deterrence. And they kept that, unfortunately, all of that is kaput, and it's now nuclear modernization. Every day there's more and more, uh, there's a growing, uh, a growing arsenal and so on and so forth, and China refuses to be part of any arms control. Uh, not that there are, that there are, there is a lot of governance uh, and arms control going, but they plain refuse uh, to be part of that game. Uh, and much more on China. You know, China keep, well, anyways, don't get me going, but um, <laughs> then there is, of course, the whole complex of North Korea. Uh, and, you know, we had a um, six party talks at some point talking about I'm trying to address the governance part. You know, we had the six party talks where everybody got together. I got to attend some of these shadow six party talks uh, meetings with North Koreans and all that. That's, of course, um, nowhere right now. And then there's a whole complex of issues having to do with Iran, uh, Iran and Russia now, and uh, etc. So uh, maybe I'll leave one more minute with a couple of rays of hope, but this is just because I'm trying hard. <laughs> <laughs> so I personally believe the Biden administration has responded just right to Putin's threats. Uh, for me, it's caution, but not cowardly. Second point is that the 65 states parties to something called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, okay, so we're talking governance. This, there are several institutions out there, including this treaty uh, on the complete prohibition of nuclear weapons and another treaty called the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Those are part of the architecture of governance of, um, nuclear weapons that are under duress. This treaty, the treaty of the complete prohibition of nuclear weapons, nobody should have it, right? Uh, which of course has not been universally um, acceded to or whatever the language is, uh, not just by the five or nine nuclear weapon states, but also by many others, including Japan, but many others that uh, lean on uh, others for extended deterrence. Uh, those are also not signatories of this treaty, but all I want to say is that the parties that are signatories of this treaty issued a political statement uh, that I think is helpful, noting that, and I'm going to quote, any use or threat of use of nuclear weapons is a violation of international law, including the Charter of the United Nations, and condemning unequivocally any and all nuclear threats, whether they be explicit or implicit and irrespective of the circumstances. I uh, end of quote. Uh, the reason I, uh, I cite this, and there's another uh, site having to do with a non-proliferation treaty, which is yet another pillar of the system, uh, reinforcing sort of this un unacceptable, unacceptable uh, uh, use of threats, nuclear-related nuclear threats. Uh, I, I, these statements, I, I bring them up because they convey some moral authority from countries that don't have nuclear weapons and so on. Yeah, uh, but I wouldn't hold my breath regarding the effects on Putin and his allies. Yes. Thanks. Uh, no, thank you. As you started, excuse me, I was thinking somebody earlier said um, that this is all, all the discussions have been somewhat depressing. And I feel like Ethel was like, hold my beer. <laughs> but, but now it's up to you, Alex. Okay. <laughs> Planetary disaster. Uh, okay, so as a preface to my remarks, I'll note that I'm also not a uh, Swedish Empire expert. 
learned a few minutes ago from Google that uh, I, I am from Delaware, and Sweden's uh, colony in the, in the New World was apparently in the Delaware Valley, so that was interesting. <laughs> and they, they apparently lost it to the Dutch in the 1600s, so maybe that's part of the answer of yeah. why empires retrench, you lose. <laughs> um, so uh, so uh, like Anne, I focus on uh, China, and I've been particularly interested in the current project I'm working on is looking at uh, environment as a tool of rising empire, I guess you would say. And so uh, in, and I'm thinking about it in terms of how does China legitimate itself in the world through environmental policies <coughs> and rhetoric. So if you, if you think of China's behavior in uh, the environmental, uh, kind of international environmental negotiations, they've become much more active in the last 20 years. And so you know, before that, they were largely kind of participating, but didn't really have much capacity to be very active. Uh, largely took the role of defending the global south and fending off kind of uh, uh, incursions from the developed world, defending the interests of the, of the developing world. And then in the last 10 years or so, they've become much more active in presenting a proactive vision of who they are uh, environmentally. So that's been uh, pretty interesting to, to track. So just to give you a, a quick example, uh, they hosted the um, uh, portion of the biodiversity uh, negotiations just recently. And there, the theme, they actually incorporated kind of foreign policy speak uh, in the sense that uh, the Chinese ideological concept of environmental protection is called ecological civilization. Uh, and they also talk about, uh, often in their foreign policy language, about building a shared future for all of mankind. So this idea that what China does is good for, for everybody. And so the theme of that biodiversity meeting uh, was purely in, in terms of Chinese rhetoric. It was called uh, ecological civilization, called one building a shared future for all of life on earth. So not just mankind, but now all uh, life on, on earth. But that, that was an uh, example of an effort to just sort of incorporate this language into the, the global uh, rhetoric. And so, so one of the questions is how much traction are they getting with this? A lot of this uh, feels like greenwashing. A lot of people are skeptical, but they're, well, what's interesting to me are areas where it feels like China is getting uh, some, some purchase. So in the area of climate change, uh, we know that China is the, the largest emitter in the world, and there are lots of uh, reasons to be concerned about China's uh, behavior. They're, they're uh, continuing uh, to build coal-fired power plants and, and those sorts of things. But one of the areas that have gotten traction is in uh, their clean tech manufacturing area. So, uh, they now absolutely dominate the supply chains of solar PV, wind turbines, batteries, all of the technologies that are going to be necessary to solving uh, climate change, su such that, as, you, as you're probably well aware, it's become a trade issue, it's become a geopolitics kind of issue. Now there's countermeasures from the Biden administration to, to address that and to create, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. was really our own, uh, the U.S.'s own industrial policy to counter kind of Chinese uh, actions. And so th this creates a kind of interesting dilemma, right? The very uh, reason China got into these areas was because it was an area that there were no global incumbents there already, and they wanted, they saw an opportunity there. Uh, but it presents a dilemma for the current empire in that if you want to move quickly on uh, climate change, it means sort of sending a lot of dollars to the rising empire. And so it's, it's led to a lot of debates uh, within, within the Beltway, it splits among different factions, uh, debates on to the extent the extent to which you should tie climate change to other issues like human uh, human rights. And that, uh, you know, those are all debates that are, are important to have, but uh, I'm interested in the way that it creates a space for China to expand, even though there's all of this opposition to China, right? Because I think, uh, frankly, the reality is that despite all the tough talk on this, we're going to need to buy these things from China for the foreseeable future, right? Despite all the money we're investing right now, it's going to take some time, 10, 20 years before you really diversify the supply chain. So that creates a dilemma. We either move on climate change or we don't. And you know, if we don't, uh, and, you know, to, in order to keep China down, then I think it's, it's, uh, it, it creates some uh, problems uh, environmentally and, and uh, for our uh, survival. Um, in this space, also the sort of behavior of the current empire matters, right? The, the fact that the U.S. has been pretty slow on climate change, and actually during Trump pulled out of uh, Paris, 
was a real boon to, to China, right? They were, all these headlines came out during the Trump administration about whether China was now a climate leader. And it had a lot to do with, you know, a lot of this was really pretty, um, a, a way to criticize the US, but China really took advantage of that, uh, that situation and, and helped to um, use it to elevate their own position. The very fact of a sort of climate crisis also accrues to the advantage of China's sort of governance model because crisis is, a, is an opportunity to say we need a strong government hand uh, and uh, you know people are, are going to sort of uh, you know, see the, the validity in that, that argument. So that dynamic creates a, an opening uh, for, for China. So um, I think I'll just uh, stop uh, there. It wasn't uplifting at all, but <laughs> it's okay. Um, count. Thanks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the United Nations and its relationship to empire, and I'll just make a few broad points, and then I, I guess we'll we'll open it up for discuss amongst ourselves. So, so first, from the very beginning and continuing today, there's been a debate about whether the United Nations was a tool of empire or opposed to empire. So even in 1945, even before 1945, as it's being negotiated in the Barton Oaks in San Francisco, uh, this debate is sort of raging and many people continue to view it as a new code of empire, which was a phrase that Elaine Locke used to refer to the League of Nations previously, uh, and that it had a kind of imperial quality to it. Um, others saw it as fundamentally opposed uh, and you can see, for example, the language of self-determination right in the very first provisions of the UN Charter, right up there uh, in Article 1. Uh, and then continuing through something David mentioned a moment ago, the creation of the trusteeship process, which was uh, a critical element uh, in the plan or the approach to begin to unwind certain aspects of empire. Regardless of the disposition of that debate, either now or amongst historians today, um, it is the case that over the ensuing 20 years, 30 years, continuing <coughs> forward, in fact, all the way up till today, the UN was the site of an enormously significant process of decolonization. It was not necessarily the driving motor of that process, uh, but without question, the UN became the place, in particular in the General Assembly, uh, but also to some degree in trusteeship, where uh, debates about the future of empire took hold and in which rhetoric uh, and actually reality began to shape a process that was astonishingly fast in the eyes of contemporaries. And I'll just note a kind of interesting fact that I uh, deploy in the book that David mentioned um, about the degree to which people did not anticipate the retreat of empire. So when the United Nations was being built, if you've been to the buildings on First Avenue, you've seen this large campus that was, of course, not right away built. That was only opened in 1950, roughly, and then sort of the early 50s fully opened up. So starting around 1947, the UN had to think about what was the size of the projected organization. There were 50 signatories in San Francisco. And as they thought about that, uh, and they actually had to task the, the architects. How big do we make this? They chose a number that they thought was realistic, and that number was about 70. And within just a few years, they had hit that. And of course, today we have 193 member states. So wildly overshooting anyone's expectations about the rapidity uh, of the process of unwinding European empire, including people like Ralph Bunch, who were deeply invested in that process, did not expect that to happen. So the UN became a very important site. And then as that process begins to take hold uh, in a sort of ratchet effect, uh, new states were entering the UN system. One of the very first things they wanted to do was join the UN as an expression of their newfound sovereignty. In some cases, even before independence, Congo, Patrice Lumumba sends a, a, a missive to Doc Hammarskjöld three days before uh, independence to say, we're ready to join. And the UN has to say, well, hold up. You need 72 hours before you're actually an independent state. And so there was an enormous degree of eagerness to get into the UN and then to use the UN as a tool for further retreat. We can talk at some length about the, the factors behind that, um, but I'll just note that that was a very important historical process. Of course, an unfinished one. And so third point, you know, I want to emphasize that that process of decolonization, particularly through the UN, was dominated by a form of empire, but not all forms of 
And by that I mean, there were debates from the very beginning about whether colonialism, as it was understood at the time, required, as some people said, salt water between the metropole and the colony, or instead could encompass adjacent forms of empire. And of course, the two leading superpowers who had a, for varied reasons, had an interest in unwinding traditional European empire were fine with a kind of salt water definition. It's something that suggested that what they were doing and had done throughout their history, incorporating uh, whether it was indigenous nations or adjacent nations, we're seeing this playing out right now, uh, that those efforts by the then Soviet Union, by the United States, also true of China, um, some of you true in many countries, but certainly very true of those superpowers, that that was left off the table. And so uh, while empire itself in its traditional form um, is a vestige of what it once was, there are of course still tiny little vestiges all around. Even in this country, uh, we retain Puerto Rico and Guam and many other places that uh, are imperial in, uh, in our control over them. Those are relatively small, but the core question of would this land form of empire, this adjacent form of empire, this empire that didn't fit that salt water or clean water definition, would that be permitted, was shunted to the side. And so we continue to see that even well into the 21st century, right up to today. And so I'll just close by noting that in some ways, to go back to the question of whether the UN was conceived as an imperial or an anti-imperial institution, one thing that we know for sure is that it was conceived as an institution that would entrench and empower five particular states, all of whom possessed some degree of imperial control. <coughs> and we continue to see those powers, which are extreme, being exercised on behalf of empire today, most notably with regard to uh, the war on Ukraine on the part of Russia. Russia continues to be able to forge ahead with very little growing out of the UN because the UN was designed to be able to do nothing when a great power, when a permanent five member had an interest that it considered to be sacrosanct. And so that's not a flaw, it's a design. That was a deliberate choice. And that continues to enable, whether it's an American empire uh, or in this particular case, a growing Russian empire. So I'll stop there and great. look forward to your questions. Great, thank you to all four of you. That was so I want to, um, you know, you, we've raised several different issues. We've got data, technology, all, you know, all of the issues, Anne, that you started with, we have nuclear weapons, we have issues around climate change. And, and I wonder how each of you think about the competition that's inherent in these things. So it's sort of a competition between, for example, data, which is wrapped up in issues of Chinese power. And also, you know, because we know that there's an extraterritoriality to China's um, digital control. It's not just balloons floating over Montana, right? It's also, you know, the reach of censorship and WeChat and it's reached into, you know, Canadian, Chinese people using WeChat and, and things like that. So I wonder, maybe it's starting with you, Anna, you, as you think about that, that kind of tension between power or sovereignty or empire, whatever we want to call it, and global governance. What, what, are the, what are the opportunities, what are the possibilities for there to be any kind of resolution for them? And, and I kind of, the question goes to each of these different areas. But starting with you again. Thank you. So that's a great question. Is, and actually, I was really, you know, seeing the different backgrounds that we have, I was like, oh, this is going to be exciting to see how we pull it together. And the, and I felt like it actually pulled together in really fascinating ways. So I'm actually going to start with maybe with Alex and then Cal and then go to Etel in terms of how I see things related. So when Alex was talking about this community of, of shared destiny or a community of common future or shared future, depending on there are many ways, many translations. Um, but one of the things that we see is that this is actually also an argument that China makes for why um, why countries may want to participate in the um, in China's World Internet Forum um, to participate in this community of, of common destiny or a shared future. Um, and so this language is something that we see occurring across a wide range of different of different platforms. Now, when we look at something like the United Nations, we also see China's efforts in the in the ITU to become heavily involved in standard setting. Um, and this is another mechanism for essentially building these building these common 
pathways toward common prosperity by, for example, forcing Chinese firms to share facial recognition technology that other firms who have similar facial technology developed would not be willing to share because the Chinese government wants to be the first the first mover in terms of establishing in terms of establishing terms and standards. And the way to do that is by sharing what that technology looks like. So they this just is not the secretariat, though. Pardon? They just lost the secretariat of the ITU. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's your something. Right, exactly. And there's there's been a lot of pushback, but at the same time, we also have you know Chinese um, former Chinese government officials who still maintain significant roles in this area. But there are there is a lot of skepticism for sure. Um, but then when we think about something like the nuclear question, this becomes really interesting if we're looking at questions of governance and different mechanisms for building power. So. In a Chinese context, we see something like the Belt and Road Initiative, which is heavily grounded in um, trade and investment globally, or um, the analogous Digital Silk Road Project, which is building out digital infrastructure globally, um, as well as the related environmental projects that are connected to both the Digital Silk Road and the, um, and the Belt and Road Initiative. We also see a decision to actually, as, as Etel pointed out, to be rel comparatively limited in terms of nuclear investment vis-a-vis um, -vis other major other major empires now i just want to close my remarks really quickly with the balloon <laughs> <laughs> and this is just to point out that the balloon in many ways um, underscores a lot of these tensions about how how we might balance shared trade and investment and you know the, the and the shared future um, so one of the one of the potential descriptors by the Chinese government was that the balloon was a weather balloon, may be connected to um, to climate change to climate science, but also had large amounts of surveillance equipment on it. So it, it forms this, and you know, also is connected, you know, with the with the history of Japanese balloon bombs, um, this kind of history of of concerns about about nuclear war. So when we're thinking about these tensions and about these questions of global governance, even though we're each talking about these individual segmented categories, the balloon shows us we can't really separate them. So. Can we pose a question? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Can I, please. So I'm just curious, thinking about. Uh, what you just mentioned, the ITU, yeah. China's efforts, generally other authoritarian states to have yeah. greater control over data flows, data yeah. sovereignty, the kind of language that the Chinese government uses. You know, one of the things that seems striking is that the, certainly in previous, uh, in Tunis and previous other places where the world has sort of come together to try to figure out a future structure for governing these questions, there's a kind of retreat from multilateralism on the part of the United States and its allies in part to get away from the ITU. The ITU right. or other organizations that they would traditionally support now might be dominated by China. So we <coughs> take our marbles and go to something else, multi-stakeholder, some other kind of... Even, even WTO? Yeah, even the WTO. Yeah. I mean, you could say that even going back to GATT, WTO, uh, you know, it's a kind of tool that the US often uses. Do you see that sustaining itself in the years to come, that um, that those traditional forums will be sort of shunted aside mm -hmm. as the West in particular tries to strike a different kind of balance? Yeah. So I think I think that's a terrific question. And actually, um, just looking at a U.S. context and coming from, um, coming from the D.C. area, I did a lot of research for my book in, in the Department of Commerce talking to people, different people in the Department of Commerce about their perspectives on this. And one of the things that was really interesting was, um, first of all, that um, I noticed a shift in, in terms of time period. So when I first started doing research in 2017, this idea that the US, for example, would pay for corporations or would pay, pay for people in the Department of Commerce to go and you know, take a more active role was something that was very, you know, very antithetical to what their, to what their views were, were about um, in terms of standard setting. Um, that has shifted as we've seen more Chinese and more Chinese involvement in standing in establishing technical standards. Um, but also we're seeing um, Chinese firms take a more active role in even standards that are being set by the Department of Commerce through things like like NIST. Um, and so there's a there's a certain tension of, you know, even if you decide to pull back completely, Chinese firms are heavily invested in these areas and they have a lot of support from the Chinese government and also a fair amount of pressure from the Chinese government to be involved in, in standard setting. So I don't think that taking your marbles and going home when you're operating in a global techno ecosystem is something that's even feasible at this point. And unless unless there's like a really major decoupling and we change our entire lobbying system, which, you know, I mean, it's not impossible these days with what's going on. <laughs>
Thank you. That's all. Well, hello. I mean, I think Anne actually answered the question for all of us. That's so true. Yeah, that's true. Sorry, sorry. So I don't know if you. No, but Ethel, I wonder if you. So there's a there's a kind of a um, a theme of state dominance in different forms. So whether it's China and and sort of the U.S. and Europe and the climate change negotiations, and you know those kind of get re reduced to some high level battle, or in the ITU, International Telecommunications yeah. Union. Um, you know, it becomes like these are very big global issues, but then they get reduced to some of these like major geopolitical battles. And I wonder if in the nuclear context, and so like particularly in the NPT, we have this global forum designed to reduce the threat of nuclear weapons. Do you see the same kind of pattern where, the you know, like in, a, in an NPT review conference, maybe 15, 20 years ago, it all came down to sort of Egypt, and, and there were battles between a few states. That, that there are battles about power, even though they're also supposed to be battles about solving global problems. Do you see that the same kind of pattern in in the NPT? So the NP, the M, is this working? So the the, the NPT is um, is this. Um, uh, international agreement signed uh, in 1968 um, and ratified in 1970 that tends to be vilified, especially by um, you know, harsh critics of the NPT that see in it the, the uh, reification of, of, of power uh, in the sense of empire in the sense that there are five recognized nuclear weapon states and all the rest all the other signatories to the npt are uh, basically uh, committed not to develop nuclear weapons but there is a there is an interesting bargain there okay so before i go into the bargain for a second because the bargain uh is alive and well okay now more than ever with with uh, with the ukraine i would argue but Cal mentioned there are 193 uh, member states in the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know what the number of NPT signatories is? One ninety one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Spain only acceded to the NPT in the nineteen eighties. Sorry, sorry. Anyways, it's, we have it's, a ringer. <laughs> it's actually a huge deal, is what I'm trying to say. Almost, almost now. There are, again, members of the NPT that are nuclear weapon states, the five, and all the rest have surrendered their right, but in exchange for something else. Don't confuse the NPT with an, a purely anti-nuclear uh, treaty, right? Actually, the IAEA, the agency that is part of this non-proliferation regime, is actively training all around the world in nuclear technologies and the diffusion of peaceful nuclear technology. So this is not an anti-nuclear, you know, nuclear freeze kind of entity. Uh, so it's an important treaty. It's, it's been vilified for, for that reason on the one hand, but it does actually, you know, uh, when there's no other game in town, you don't want to get, just like with democracy, we were having this conversation, you don't want to undermine, um, like in the previous panel, some, somebody, uh, Vincent, I think, uh, formulated. You don't want to undermine whatever can rescue, uh, you know, the the, the, the threats uh, from from getting even worse. So the NPT has many deficiencies, but it has served a certain purpose. Now, uh, right now, because of the uh, Ukraine situation. Uh, obviously, Russia is 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 a, is a one of the five uh, member states and uh, it's extremely hard to coordinate any kind of positive steps vis-a-vis -vis other countries in the realm of both vertical proliferation for instance in the realm of vertical proliferation russia has now uh, refused to uh, conduct inspections in the very last uh, arms control agreement in existence. We have many. The very last arms control in existence, the, the new uh, 
the uh, uh, new start, no, no start, no, no, it's, 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 yes, the new start agreement. Russia is refusing to allow inspections. Uh, the United States is trying to bring that about. Uh, and the inability to control the vertical proliferation aspect of it is one dimension, but there's also the horizontal proliferation. So who is not working with Russia? Uh, and uh, empowering Russia to wreak a lot of havoc in, in the Ukraine, well, none other than <coughs> Iran. So whereas up until a year ago, countries may have converged, especially European countries or what is called the E3 plus three or the UN five plus one, whatever you want to call it, there was some sort of agreement, especially under the Biden administration, that you might be able to restore, you know, the JCPOA vis-a-vis -vis Iran uh, and somehow work it out. Well, Iran, of course, the Iranian government has done a lot to undermine that part as well, but uh, the Ukraine war has done even more because it's extremely hard now to revive collaboration that includes Russia. Uh, Iran now is a major ally of Russia. I mean, Iran, Russia is extremely dependent on, on Iran uh, and, and North Korea, so it's the least likely to participate in any kind of effort in that direction. Uh, or on the North Korean side of China, same thing, by the way. China's indirect uh, role in this nuclear proliferation uh, aspect is uh, by supplying missiles to North Korea, Iran, um, um, another, uh, Saudi Arabia, and others. So, but uh, to return to the impact of the Ukraine war on this issue of horizontal proliferation, meaning other countries joining the so-called nuclear flood, is a very worrisome development because countries are now thinking, <coughs> well, those of us that renounced nuclear weapons by signing the NPT, okay? Uh, maybe we made a mistake. Ukraine did that. And look what happened to the Ukraine. I, have the, I, I really would like to take a minute to read you the language of something called the Budapest Memorandum, which was a document signed in 1994 by the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom and the United States, to persuade, almost coerce, but persuade Ukraine to renounce nuclear weapons that were in its possession because it inherited them from uh, of the Soviet Union. And the memorandum prohibited the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom and the US from, and I quote, threatening or using military force or economic coercion against Ukraine, except in self-defense or otherwise in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations. And then China and uh, France gave somewhat weaker assurances in separate documents. So the Ukraine renounces nuclear arsenal. And what is it today? I but this is, but this answer is also an argument that presumably, I mean, Iran could make, given the fact that it was the Trump administration that essentially gave it, you know, stepped away from the JCPOA. Um, for its own reasons, and Iran didn't get what it thought was part of the bargain, which was, you know, in a way, a kind of selfish act of the United States that wasn't taking into account the, the ideals of nuclear non-proliferation. And so, I mean, I guess I wonder, we should sort of branch out into other areas here too, but, but I wonder if the story of either Russia, Ukraine, or the potential for non-proliferation is if we could put it as like a multipolar failure. It's not just a failure of one state doing one thing, but it's it's certainly many states, right, that, that have kind of opened the door to some of this. No question that the Trump administration, in my view, made a major mistake in undoing the JCPOA, but probably the party that has made more mistakes than any other, I would argue, having written uh, in support of the JCPOA and all that, is Iran. Okay. But I, I also think that um, the um, Ukraine war is orders of magnitude more consequential for the, you asked me about the NPT and I'm trying to stay on, for the NPT, the Ukraine uh, demonstration effect of the Ukraine war is orders of magnitude more resonating with the 
Saudi Arabia is on, um, and many people are talking about you know, South Korea, Japan, uh, Taiwan, all these countries that are thinking, wait a second, you know, we're, we're, our security is guaranteed. I mean, will the US, you know, risk LA? <laughs> for um, you know. so there is a rethinking of that. I've been on. There is a huge debate in my field, you know, about uh, about why is it that over the last 40, 50 years, no other country except these, okay, except the, except North Korea and Iran, potentially, uh, or more than potentially, have developed nuclear weapons. We don't have. We had a stationary number of nuclear weapon states at nine for decades now and the question is is this going to continue yeah I, I just we'll, want, we'll open it up to questions after yeah I, I just wanted to raise the, the issue of you know what what does kind of great power competition mean for everyone else essentially right like so in the climate context there's been inter interesting there's a lot of discussion about the hedging strategies of, of developing countries and so one example of, of how this has played out recently was in the uh, the recent uh, climate negotiations. This issue of so-called loss and damage became uh, one of the big issues of this past year. And this is essentially the idea of kind of tort-like damages for all the countries that will face harms in small nations, inundated, uh, low-lying uh, countries that will get, get flooded, that, that sort of thing. And so for the first time, the, the big developed countries were willing to talk about this and, and agreed to sort of move forward to talk about the details of this. And so you saw an interesting competition between uh, the U.S. and China, for example. The U.S. has constantly been trying to pull China to, away from the developing countries to kind of give more responsibility for China in the climate negotiations. And um, it sort of tried to shame China into offering up money for loss and damage. And so where it seemed to have played out was all of the, the big uh, contributors to the problem sort of said, look, we don't want to treat it like a legal duty to provide this, but we are willing to throw in some, some money. So there's the potential, we don't know how this will play out yet, but there's the potential that there'll be some more money coming to uh, the, the smaller nations will be harmed by climate change. And, and then in another, another area, I've been looking uh, into the lithium triangle area in South America, Argentina, uh, Chile, and Bolivia. And uh, there are a lot of Chinese companies and American companies trying to uh, get concessions and in moving into these areas. Um, uh, Germany was just in Chile offering to have more, um, more pro you know, locating more processing facilities within Chile uh, in exchange for the right to get more uh, lithium concessions. Whereas the idea was that China is just taking the raw materials, doing all the, the, the work and taking all the jobs back to China. And so that sort of competition has the potential to play out well for, for the, the countries that are the targets of this, but of course there's no guarantee. So it'd be interesting to see how that plays out going forward. Great. So let's open up to questions. Questions. Yes. Thank you. It's about the environmental uh, you know, and in the spirit of looking for something optimistic to say. Um, is there anything plausible in the idea that we might imagine energy transition leading to a significant reordering of our political economies, uh, a new kind of localization of, of our political economies? Is there anything, can we possibly imagine that it might reorder or even break the links between capital extraction, you know, physical colonialism. Uh, is, is that just wildly uh, uh, optimistic? Or do you ever, yeah. does anyone on the panel ever like find themselves in their quiet moments, you know, thinking thinking down those lines? Yeah, so that's, that's an enormous question, obviously. But uh, so the, the energy transition is obviously a massive one, which is why we've had so good <laughs> success in it. But it's interesting, I mean, we're at a moment where we're seeing real signs of opportunity, like the, the cost of renewables is now, you know, lots of studies coming out in certain areas, the cost of building new solar and wind is cheaper than is continuing to use existing coal fired power plants, for example. So the economics are changing, electric vehicles are starting to become viable and policies are changing in that regard. So, so the, uh, those will change political economy in uh, you know, predictable and unpredictable 
ways, right? So right now the concern is obviously that it's really accruing to the benefit of China. So those who are thinking in terms of geopolitical terms are worried that of all the economic benefits that will come from this. There's all this talk about reshoring manufacturing to the US, but it seems like most people who are know these industries are worried about the possibility of that really happening, and certainly at least in the, in the near term. Right? So, so maybe, you know, how will this play out for, for climate? It feels like there's going to be a lot of work for the lawyers and consulting firms and DC to structure things that actually involve Chinese technology that don't run afoul of the laws, probably. You know, I, but I guess I'm also, also thinking, how does, how does it play out that empire? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, for I think part of the story for China is that they, they had an idea that these were real economic opportunities. And so, so again, to the dilemma I mentioned before, part of the dilemma is if you really want to grapple with climate change quickly, it probably means empowering change. Can I have a two finger here? We're talking about the good side, you know, uh, investment in solar panels and all that. That's a good side. China is also the uh, um, highest consumer of coal mm -hmm. and, uh, for electricity yeah. generation. And now it's cozying up to Australia, and what does it buy from Australia? Coal. And so on. So there is this other side sure. that is huge, looming. So China wants to offset, yeah. offset that, um, you know, uh, immense consumption of, of coal and continue that commitment to coal with this other right. side of it. So they're completely hedging on both sides. The old economy, they are, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're still investing in coal. And then they've invested heavily in the new economy. So they, they have sort of security in both paths for now. The long-term target for them, like many other countries, is, a, is carbon neutrality. China's target for carbon neutrality is 2060, US and Europe's 2050, and many countries are 2050. And so that's the game right now. Can we get there between now and those those dates? Right? And so a lot's gonna happen. Can I ask a follow-up question to Alex on this? Yeah, of course. Okay, so this is, this is Great. I mean, like, I, I feel like it's a treat to have this expert that I can ask. Okay. So when you're when we're looking at these kind of to build on, Al, on Adam's question, um, in terms of the climate vulnerabilities that different countries face. So on one hand, there's this process of empowering China, you know, through or you know, through the growth of you know of financial markets uh, related to clean tech and also through clean tech and its exports. But by the same token, we see Chinese cities being particularly, Chinese cities like Shanghai or Hong Kong being particularly vulnerable yeah. to the effects of climate change. Yeah. So when looking at a kind of time horizon question, yeah. how do we think about the, the potential impacts for the possibility of both power, the growth of power as, yeah. well, as well as the recession of power due to those potential climate effects? Like re recession of power or, or, or the fact that would it change the way they behave right, yeah. because of the vulnerability? Right. Because I, I think, you know, it's been notable over the last 15 years, you know, China's been very active in international climate politics really since the mid, early, you know, 2005, 2006, that, that period. Uh, and, uh, they've been very clear that entire time that China will be affected by climate change. So there was none of this nonsense about the battle over the science and the <clears throat> denialism and, and that sort of thing that was, um, that was very strong in the U.S. And um, so how does that, you know, the, the, but they've always argued about who's responsible for it. Yeah. You know, they've always said, look, it's still the U.S. and Europe and, and, all, and all that kind of thing. So, I think there's probably some belief in you know this kind of techno belief that they will be able to solve it. You know, I, I think I think there's probably that that faith, um, which is underlying the way they're approaching it because they are moving aggressively on clean tech. But as you point out, they're still holding that old line of coal for energy security reasons. Um, but I think there is a faith when you talk to people. You know, part of this is they don't you know people within the system don't feel that freedom to be critical, but right. there's also this sense that, oh, you know, the government's throwing all its resources behind this, and we have a lot of smart technical people. And, and true, there are just so many kind of technical teams working on very specific, in, in an impressive way. And so there is a sense that, look, we will be able to solve this technology. Can so. I make a comment? Um, just going back to, well, just three things. One is with the UN system, um, with this, the structure of the UN system and having 
works within that massive bureaucracy. Um, the understanding how it's funded is really important to the dynamics of how it functions and the decisions that are made and the power dynamics uh, within the UN. So the United States puts a lot of money into the UN more so than some of the other states. That actually does give them outsized voice in decision making um, for that body. And the same goes for other European nations who have more to put in. Um, so understanding that I think is important so that it, it does not have the sense that it is this sort of egalitarian body of nations that have come together. The same power dynamics actually play out precisely because of how it is resourced, right? And that's been a, a big moment of tension. The other is this consensus based uh, voting method that tends to um, if you have, you need to have veto power over decisions because if you have a consensus model, one person or one member state that says no, basically cancels the whole thing out. And so we've seen that as understanding why it's in place, but it also is a way of perpetuating the status quo where you do have strategically placed member states on certain bodies who do know that they have that veto power and they can therefore ensure that the more Transformative. I was going to say radical, but that's that's, that's extreme. <laughs> yeah, that's extreme. Right. I just had to stop myself. Um, but so some of those decisions actually don't get made. Um, we had a situation where they, we had a new uh, body that was established via resolution uh, two years ago, and it is supposed to be a forum for people of African descent, comprised of people of African descent. That was in the mandate in the modalities that we had drafted. And yet, when it came down to appointing the members of that forum, um, we had uh, we have a represent, representative from China who is not a person of African descent, right? And if it was a person of African descent, we wouldn't have cared. It would have been great. But it's not a person of African descent. And prior to the representative from China being on there, it was this competition between uh, China and Russia. But then the war started in Ukraine, so then Russia just got booted out and was no longer on the table. And so now they are in a position where they have, because it's a consensus model, they have access to uh, information that supports essentially Chinese interests on the continent, in Central and South America, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, the Caribbean, where we are trying to develop strategies that actually advance the cause of people of African descent around the world. This is within the structure of the United Nations. So, I'm pointing that out because we engage with the UN because you know, we kind of have to, we, it's a vehicle, but it does reify many of the same systems and structures, just like your G20, your G7, you didn't become the G20 without the exploitation from the transatlantic slave trade and global capitalism, yet they have outsized influence and voice on determining the global financial architecture, monetary policy, recently tax policy that affects everyone. So I feel like it's important to note that. And then on the issue of climate, because I was at COP27 where loss and damage is what we fought very hard, which is actually climate reparations. But again, the R word, which we could not utter, loss and damage was more acceptable. And so we pushed and pushed to get this on the agenda because of this notion that the global north, largely, is producing most of the vast majority of the climate stressors that the global south, particularly small island states uh, around the world, the Caribbean, even Pakistan, Nigeria, the floods, all of that. And so the notion of paying the who should pay, well, I mean, it's who can disagree with if you if you're the cause of the issue, why wouldn't you be responsible for the remedy? Right? It's a very simple, we tend to, we tell that to our children, but somehow when it comes to this notion of the world is ending because of climate disaster, we, we have to stop and ponder. And the last thing that I'll say as we talk about climate change is we have a growth model economic system. We measure strength of economy on GDP, which means you have this infinite growth model on a finite planet. So all of the multinational corporations that are built on consumption and growth who have no plans of changing their structure. And we have not talked about how we actually change the nature of our global economy so that we're not measuring by growth. What are other metrics we can use to determine a healthy economy? Because 
all of the innovations that we come up with, the carbon capture, the formulas, all of these fancy things that they come to COP27 every year to talk about mean absolutely nothing if we don't actually address the underlying fundamental underpinning of our entire economy, our economic system, which is built on destruction, extraction, and basically, you know, wasting the resources on the planet. And no one wants to have that conversation. So we talk about facts, figures, models, and things in 2030 and 2050, but we're not actually getting to the heart of the issue, which is the only thing that can actually reel us back from the cliff of disaster, not to end on oh, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> that. Oh that was amazing. That was amazing. That was great. And I think you've, you've kind of uh, maybe described the next one of these conferences, because that was a ton of stuff, and it was really great. But I want to maybe turn it to Cal first, because the first part of your comment is really, you know, there, there's a way in which the UN is like, it's not a coalition of democracies, but it's a coalition of empires. And, you know, I think your comment goes to reform, but like at a very deep level, not just like membership, but rulemaking. And I wonder if Cal, how you respond to some of these, this critique. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously those points are really uh, powerful and important. I, I do think it's always a compare to what question and you know, this is a situation where whether whether we're dealing with whatever issue we're dealing with in the uh, in the global context, but particularly let's say climate, uh, where you know the alternatives are absent some kind of institutional structure, it's a more naked exercise of power. And so you know we could see this with with Russia, uh, we could see it with climate change. It is still a fundamentally power based system. I am a political scientist, although I teach in a law school. And so I do think at bottom, that will drive much of this. So you mentioned, you know, G20 or, you know, these different groupings, they do reflect power um, and, and they always will. And I think they find ways, I think those countries find ways to rationalize, uh, like in the United States, obviously we have a kind of, you know, ridiculous wing of the country that refuses to accept even the existence of climate change. Um, but, you know, there is, you, you mentioned, is it, um, isn't it simple that, of course, there's responsibility? And I think if you trust people in the US government, we're not crazy. They might say something like, well, yes, historically, like Alex knows this, China, of course, is double the number of, uh, you know, sort of the emissions of China currently are at least double or more American emissions. But if you look cumulatively, obviously the United States is much more, but much of that occurred in a time when maybe we didn't understand the problem. And so as a result, we can say it's like an accident. It's not, uh, it's negligence, uh, but it's not knowing, it's not reckless, something like that. Those aren't very compelling, but there's something to it. And so I think people can say, well, it's fine, we'll just deal with it. Of course, China's growing and growing and growing. And so um, anyway, I'm not really answering your question, only to say, I think the, <laughs> I think the reality is that uh, we can only hope that these sort of groupings operate with some sense of justice. But your first example shows how they're so easily manipulated. So the idea that a forum of people of African descent has a Chinese national who is not African sitting on it is sort of ludicrous, but that's power. You know, in the, in the climate context, one of the things some people propose is, you know, why, why should we do this kind of uh, UN process with everyone involved and anyone can veto it? Why don't we do take the top 10 emitters and then it's right. going to be much more efficient, but then like, are those top 10 emitters going to think about the, the loss and damage of all the small states, right? Like, that's a, and for all the problems of the UN process, at least it can be a forum where people can come and raise those, those issues. It's not a great forum for being efficient in solving a big, big problem, right? Like, as we, we know, but um, again, the, the alternative could be something that would have lots of big problems that we can have to solve. Or I know that you know. Unless there's a question, I wanted to kind of follow up on, on a couple of things. Um, the second one escapes me now, but um, on China, still on China, uh, there's another dimension going back to sort of my, my issue area. Uh, China has been uh, extremely aggressive. Uh, it's not just the balloon. The balloon is so consistent with so much more that is happening happening uh, in in East Asia. This over this um, uh, military and paramilitary deployment 
all over the South China Sea, the East China Sea and so on. Intrusions, for instance, everybody knows about the intrusions in Taiwan, which uh, presumably belongs to China. But who is talking about the daily intrusions into Japan? Somebody mentioned today, well, Japan is not, you know, I Japan, Japan has been predicted in my field for 60 years to be the next nuclear weapon state. And I'm not kidding you, 60 years. And I've, re I've written extensively about Japan. It has never proved, and I against that view, that it won't do it. It won't do it for reasons having to do with not just uh, World War II, but sort of a, uh, a political economy of Japan that would preclude uh, um, overstepping in the nuclear dimension, in the nuclear area. But what I'm what I'm trying to say is that people don't come to terms with the fact that Japan has seen the nuclearization of so former Soviet Union, now Russia, China in 1964, North Korea, and Japan remains non-nuclear. But there's a point at which um, it will continue to venture that it will become nuclear because nobody else is doing more. It's kind of your question also on your end. Nobody's doing more to push Japan and South Korea in that direction than China, okay? Now, I don't believe Japan is now positioned to do that, but South Korea, the latest public opinion poll suggests that 70% of South Korean uh, respondents want, demand nuclear weapons uh, today, right? It would take a lot of uh, stamina for any kind of, and uh, the, the populism of both extreme left and extreme right in South Korea uh, may give some wind to that kind of uh, demand, hopefully not. But they're, on, they're under pressure of, uh, of this sort of resurgence of, of China, and you know, it ought not to be overlooked. I mean, sorry, I want to just intervene on this power question a little bit, because it seems to me that there's like power um, in the Security Council and the UN generally is um, it's both it's like a good and a bad. It's like it offers us a way of understanding the way the UN works, but it also in a way and I'm, I'm just curious how you react to this or think about this. It, it's it's almost like um, it's an argument against action. It's like this is the way the UN is structured, and it can never change. And I guess, and I wonder, it kind of goes to this question: like, can it change? Like, I and I get the the argument that you know what's the alternative, but there are you know arguments by governments that say the Security Council should change, right? Like why, why are the UK and France on the Security Council? You know, or any of those states, why isn't India there? And you know, maybe this current India under Modi, that argument doesn't have the same power as it did 10 years ago, but there are all these arguments for change and I wonder if those are just, are those dead letters? Or, or is there something behind them that's, that's possible? Because otherwise the arguments around change it's like you know you're beating against a kind of a, um, a, a structure, a wall that is, you know, non-responsive. Yeah, it's a really challenging question because you know, as you know, there has been discussion about recasting the UN in some way for for decades, and especially in the last 25, 30 years, um, some things have changed. So the Security Council actually changed in the 1960s, got bigger as the membership got bigger. But it didn't change the fundamentals, didn't change the permanent mm -hmm. members. And all of the discussions about uh, whether India should be on, whether uh, Japan should be on in a permanent way. This is just Security Council for a second. Those discussions, there's always a counter vote. Should it be Argentina? Should it, you know, India? You mentioned India. Pakistan's very unhappy. So there's always, um, you know, there's the major aspirants block, as it's called, and that's sort of like the major opponents block, and they just will never. So it seems almost impossible to imagine. Uh, and that at the same time, if you don't change, it's hard to, so there's so much frustration in the way that you articulated with these processes. So then the, the legitimacy, which is one of the factors that makes the UN somehow a useful tool in some cases, uh, seems to be diminishing kind of bit by bit, like dripping down until eventually all the water is out of the bathtub. And 
then what? So, you know, history suggests that the only way you get a, a real remaking is through war. That's not something that we either want or really could imagine happening. So, yeah, there's no great answer. I mean, the, the, the only thing I would add is that, you know, China, um, you know, we said a lot, talked a lot about China today. And China obviously has a vested interest in making the United Nations work well because China has a privileged place. On the other hand, China has a long history of having a very different kind of interaction with the rest of the world. It doesn't necessarily need the United Nations or think just about the next 10 years. You know, before we we'll talk about the long term vision of China, but it is true, it's a place that does tend to think in long term. So maybe there are other ways that China's already forged different kinds of relationships. So um, again, I'm not really answering, but because it's such a hard question and it feels like something that has to happen and yet never does. It's always tomorrow. Um, before, that's all. I just there was a hand here, and I know we need to wrap up, but I want to give one chance for. We don't have time. That's okay. We have one. Just time. Just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, like, at least for the question. Yeah. Just a small comment. Again, we're getting super emotional about the whole United Nations thing. We have to stop and manage our expectations. This organization was not created at something outside of this world. It was created reflecting this world. So somebody was talking this morning about what happened in Ethiopia with China getting into Ethiopia. I've been working in Ethiopia. I've been working in Ethiopia trying to stop a war between two tribes who were severely damaged by the Chinese production. And this Chinese production was approved by the government of Ethiopia. So we have to stop trying to think that you know the United Nations is the creation of all evil. No, actually, it's just a reflection of a very imperfect world which is extremely unequal. And yes, money counts a lot, but it counts inside of the United Nations and outside of the United Nations. So if we want to find a solution, we're going to have to find a way to face our own problems and our own goals and our own evils inside of our countries, rather than going to an institution that it just happens to be there because a lot of countries want it to be there. And we can talk about that bilaterally from the top. <laughs> All right, I think we do have to wrap up, um, but thank our panelists.